friends, I'm Doc Ian. It's Monday again. This is August 29th, 2016. And I'm going to show you the progress I made painting in the past week. It's mostly frostbite minis. So as you can perhaps tell from the snowy bases, um, if, if we're going to start off with uh, the second half of this pair, I did the armor rack last week and this week I finished the lectern and I went for a kind of marble effect. Not quite the same. They, they, they have a more of a grayish marble and mine is kind of more beige. Um, it, it's one of the first times I've tried to do a marbling effect and I looked it up online. Uh, there's a bunch of different tutorials about how to do marble effects in miniature painting. And from what I could gather, there's basically two different techniques. One using glazes and one using wet blending. And even though uh, the wet blending one appealed more to me, to my style of painting, but I decided to try the other one first anyway, partially because I thought well, wet, wet blending probably works better if you have larger surfaces. This is uh, relatively many small facets and it could be difficult to get sort of a blend going across those. So I tried with the glazes instead. And I hope I managed to differentiate the, the, the sort of beige or tan of, of the uh, plinth from, from that of the parchment. Uh, one of the ways I try to differentiate it is that I have a, added a, a gloss coat at the end because marble should be kind of shiny here while this is more matte. Uh, I'm reasonably happy with that. Um, moving on to um, these two guys, which here are mostly black and, or dark blue. And I mentioned I thought that was kind of boring, so I tried to go for some more color. And this one, it's still pretty dark, but it's different dark colors in the different layers. And there's some more highlights on it than on the studio job, I think. The Wraith. Now the Vampire, I also went dark, but different dark colors, in this case, a, a sort of all green and a very deep red. Um, this model, let's see where the focus point is, is, is one of the prime examples of uh, how they can trick you with the advertising. Well, the, the studio paint job to me is very clearly done on a resin master, not on a production model, because if you can tell in this paint job, you can in the, the, in the sculpt here, it seems that these various wrappings around the feet and the arms, they're not clothes, but sort of leather straps, they're very, very clearly delineated. But on the model itself, uh, let's get a bit closer. There, that's closer. It, it's not just that I'm a clumsy painter. The, it's just not as obvious on, on the hands here. Uh, the, the detail just isn't there, really. Uh, let's see, we can look at this one in close-up as well. You can see that there's some purple and some green and some blue and some red. At a distance, it kind of all meshes together and looks just looks dark, but um, hopefully it still maintains some visual interest. Uh, we, we, while I'm here, we can take a closer look at the lectern. And yeah, uh, I also felt that this paint job was just black. Well, looking closely at it, there's there is some purple. It's mostly purple and gray, and extremely dark one versions of that. Um, I went a bit brighter. I, I I kept some purple, but added some green instead of gray. And I made the armor kind of brass or bronzy instead of uh, the dull iron. Um, uh, 
And yeah, uh, I, I like this sort of green and purple combination. It's it's. Ever since I used to play World of Warcraft, I played a warlock, and my favorite set of gear was the Nemesis gear, the Tier Two. Uh, robes from from um, from Bl uh, Blackwing Lair, and they they they're this sort of green, dark green and purple combination. Um, and finally, we have uh, the Wraith Knights, which here are, uh, well, in hindsight, they're, they're okay. This purple and white and uh, metal thing. But I went even brighter on these. I, uh, again, brass, sort of white cloaks for camouflage in, in the winter, perhaps. And uh, yeah, I m maybe I went a bit too bright because in hindsight, how do you tell that these are undead? Because they're completely covered up. You can't even really see their faces, which are, I guess are kind of skull-like uh, on, on, on this one guy on the right. Uh, on the one on the left, you can't see anything. I suppose the dark colors were supposed to signal that they were evil and undead, and the way I've painted them, they just look like soldiers. <laughs> and nothing to say they're wraiths, really. But, oh well. It's not like I have any lack of undead uh, minions to put on the table. And uh, I'm relatively pleased with the result anyway. So, what's up next? Oh right, I almost forgot about this little guy, uh, Roth Martin here, who <laughs> is human, but as you might notice, I painted him with leftover paint on my palette from, from the undead miniatures. Let's hope nobody notices. Um, I, you know, he's a ranger, sort of wintry thing. I, the face and the beard might not look very good in this extreme close-up, but they are extremely tiny. So, so in in uh, looking at it from a slight distance, you know, it 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 looks fine. And yeah, I tried to make the base fit in with the rest of my uh, soldiers for Frostgrave. And um, the next batch of minis is all primed and prepped and ready to go. Some of them there's stuff to say about, others not so much. I mean, this wolf is fairly simplistic, not so much. It's just gonna be a very straightforward paint job. Um, the Wraith Lord or whatever is also not very complicated. A sim very simple dirt base I went with. Um, I, I just didn't have any much imagination there. But I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting figure enough in its own right. It doesn't need a complex base. I might add some flocking or something to it. Um, Similarly, the Rider of the Dead. Uh, there was some gap filling involved. Hopefully it doesn't show. Um, I'm thinking about what sort of paint scheme to use because I looked at GW's um, sort of army of the dead, how, how they painted them, and they just paint them in, in just gray white. Again, very boring, very simplistic. Kind of like you know how in the movie Lord of the Rings, the the um, the dead that they are just translucent sort of greenish ghosts. I might go for a, a, a an overall kind of greenish tinge on them, but mm, and uh, well, we'll see. I I I don't think I think I want to do more than just simply you know dry brush it white and give it a wash of gray. That's that seems like cheating. Now. For the Necromancer here, I have assembled everything. Uh, you're going to see I haven't done that for all these heresy miniatures, but for this one I decided to go with full assembly because the pose made it difficult to paint him separately, so I needed to attach him to the rock, and the rock needed to be attached to the base. And then I added this bird here. See, I thought at first um, that this bird would be held in the upstretched hand, but eventually I figured out that if you look closely down here, you can see a left hand. So it's an alternate left hand in which would be used in place of this uh, skull goblet. 
you see, I, I was wondering why was this separate at all? That seemed really stupid. But it's, it's because you, you can have the bird instead. However, w when I experimented with it, I tried to find different positions. Whichever way I placed the hand with a bird, that is, the angle of the bird itself was really, really awkward. It just didn't work for me any which way I twisted and turned it. I was, I'm not sure what the sculptor was thinking, really. So, eventually I went with this one, and this was a tricky little pinning procedure, because it's a rather thin wrist, but I managed it. But I decided I didn't want, want to just throw this raven, as it's actually supposed to be, according to the web website. It looks more like a vulture to me, but okay, let's say it's a raven. Uh, I, I didn't want to just toss my bits box because I didn't think it was going to get used. So I, I thought I had some space over on this base. I can add a bird here, give it some more life. I yeah, hope you like the composition of it. Now, for the remainder of the Harry's Minchu, this flesh golem, I'm... Um, yeah, again, I hope I've managed to disguise where I attached the arms. Um, I'm painting him off the base. I'm, I think it, for this guy, I'm going to use one of the bases I've already painted before, just as an experiment. I think I'm going to go with this one. Yeah. Um, the ghoul king here was more difficult actually because when you have a piece like like this set of this hand the club and this arm were one piece and had to be attached at two points at this wrist and this shoulder and hiding that and making that line up seamlessly then hiding the join is tricky and i think you can see like a hairline crack there maybe when I'm using my magnification, but otherwise with the naked eye you really can't tell. Ha. Huh. He's got a rat on his shoulder. Ha huh. ha. Um, yeah, so... And I went with the, the bone club instead of the shovel for... I don't know, I just thought it looked better. And I have prepped the base for him. He's gonna be standing somewhere here, across this. I, I made this from one of my basing stamps and I put the other ghoul or corpse or whatever into this putty when it wasn't cured fully. It it's, looks a little weird now. It looks like he's been pushed into the surface and the, the it's sort of bulging out here, but... I think when I paint it up, and I'm just gonna make a dark outline, and it's it's gonna be okay, I think. And finally, uh, the witch. You will see that the only thing I've really attached to her is the head. I've left this arm off, which goes in there, and I hand primed it, a different color, because I didn't have any. Beige primer. And the reason the reason for this is that uh, let's see if we can focus. Um, if you look at the bottom of of it's planed off here, so this part of the broom is supposed to be resting on the ground or the base, and so you have to adapt the angle of the arm so that works. But the tricky part of it is, of course, that I'm I molded a base which I attach the cauldron to, where the ground is rough, it's uneven. So I don't really know until I attach the body of the witch to the base uh, what angle the broom should be. So I'm going to have to paint this in sections. And, well, anyway, so the cauldron and the fire are the metal pieces from the set. Uh, then this is uh, molded in putty, and for the logs, I just cut up some uh, um, toothpicks and glued them down.
to make it look more like a campfire or something. Uh, uh, so that's going to be the most complex sort of post build, so sort of post painting build. But I'll make it work. And here's the lineup of stuff I'm thinking of prepping for next week. I don't want to, because, because I prepped quite a few models um, for the coming week. It's, let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven models, but that simple count doesn't do justice because it's several of them are really complex and time consuming to paint jobs. So I, I might not even get all of them done by next Monday. So I don't want to prep that many new things. So I've just picked up a few, picked out a few big monsters. First off, these three Reaper Bones ogres, and well, one's an Etten and two ogres. Uh, I sort of showed you when these arrived a few weeks back. I prepped these. Uh, and I picked out some stuff that it has been lying around in my in boxes for a long time. These two Descent Minis. Now, Descent is a board game played with minis. I don't actually have the board game. I just picked up a couple of the minis for it because I th th thought they looked generic enough to be useful in other uh, contexts. So this is simply a, a huge crocodile or alligator or something. He's named Sweetheart. And this is the Siren. And, you know... It's just a sort of female water spirit. And, yeah, you know, why not? There, there, there's monsters like this in D&D. So, yeah. We'll get cracking on that. Oh, what have I been buying, you might wonder, to, to make those numbers get so close to each other again? Well... What happened was that this week a um, shipment arrived from a Kickstarter, and let's see if we can unbox it. See, it's from Raging Heroes. It is the first partial shipment of a Kickstarter I backed called Toughest Girls in the Galaxy 2. And, well... Uh, let me unpack more of these and uh, I'll show you. So I, I, I went in on this Kickstarter for quite a large pledge. Uh, so in this first batch there's 30 minis of which uh, 16 are the freebies that everybody who backed got. Everybody who backed at its sort of minimum level. And then there's some characters like this one for example. And my pledge, what I mostly went for was the fantasy human army, the sisters of the, the something, the sort of uh, fantasy nuns of battle or something. And as you can see, some of these are quite complex. These are resin models and they come in a lot of pieces, some of them. Um, they look like they will be rather fiddly to put together. But they are nicely detailed. Uh, let's see if I can find one that would be good to take out of the blister. I mean, here here's a relatively uh, sedate model. Oops. So this is the body of a kind of fantasy warrior nun. And this is the sprue with her arms and the stand. She's carrying a standard. She must be a standard bearer. She's got a weapon in one hand and she's carrying the standard in the other. And the standard is in two pieces. So there's even more assembly. Required. Not sure where it if the if the standard fits on this piece or or is this an arm? Uh, I don't 
No. But this is a left arm, left hand, this is a right hand. So yeah, I assume it must fit on on that thing. It couldn't fit on the knife. Oh well. But you, as you can probably tell, there's quite a lot of uh, careful detailing and very nice casting. There's not much... I think there's not much in the way of mold lines or flashing on some of them. You can see this. They've, they've placed the mold lines intelligently when they have to occur. Now, it's not just these humans. Uh, the freebies are, are a set uh, assortment of, of characters from, from all the factions that were included. So, for example, this, I believe, is one of the sort of dark elves. I think they're called lust elves or something. Uh, okay, so so they've cast it, so this arm is separate, but it's you have to clip it off and attach it. Uh, the other arm is in the baggie here. But again, you can sort of tell the detail. It's very nice. Because it's, there's 30 of these, I'm not going to show you all of them right now. Whenever I get around to painting them, I will, of course, do do a sort of walkthrough and uh, demonstration of all of them. Let's see if there's any really interesting ones to show you. Here's one with really wide skirts. They're all female, by the way. That's why they're called toughest girls in the galaxy, too. Um, yeah, here, here's another elf with an interesting pose and a sort of huge sword. But yeah, um, <laughs> I this this was a Kickstarter I backed a really long time ago, and it's just now be starting to be delivered. And I don't really recall what the idea was. I I think I was probably one to build some sort of army of these. Um, here's another evil multi-armed elf. So I'm not sure. I, th they don't really fit in with any of my current painting plans, so I very much doubt I'll get around to any of these this year, even. Here's one with wings. So, yeah. Maybe sometime next year. We'll see. Anyway. Uh, that was today's video. I hope you enjoyed having a look at this is some sort of familiar uh, at the um, at the progress I've made and a little hint of what's upcoming. I hope to see you again next week. In the meantime, you can click a thumbs up on this video and. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. But for now, I'm Dakian, and I'm signing off.